Welcome to a special edition of Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie, and since the coronavirus pandemic has many more of us working from home, possibly self-isolating or perhaps even in quarantine, we thought you might have some free time on your hands and be looking for something to listen to. So, we're working on a few ideas to help keep your mind off social distancing until things get back to normal. When I was in Christchurch, New Zealand for DramFest 2020, I took part in a panel discussion on whiskey's past and its future. Our good friend, longtime whiskey writer and star of the movie The Amber Light, Dave Broom, was the moderator. We were joined by another veteran whiskey guru, the one and only Charles McLean, along with DramFest founder and co-owner of the Whiskey Galore Shop in Christchurch, Michael Fraser Milne. Now all three of these guys hold the title of Master of the Quake, and it was an honor to be asked to join them for the hour-long discussion in front of an audience in the theater at Christchurch Town Hall on March 7, 2020. The only thing we've edited out is a bit of microphone noise here and there, but we're presenting the entire discussion as it happened with a few audio glitches along the way. All right, guys, uh, are you all having a good drum fest? Yeah. That was kind of mediocre response as far as I'm concerned. So. Are you having a good drum fest? Yeah. Significantly better. And, and yeah, yeah, that's too much. <laughs> Oh, God, that's when the volunteer security <laughs> take, take this ambassador out. No, he's an ambassador. He's a good guy. A... Uh, welcome to the second of... So, sorry, I'm, I'm doing this lights around my eyes. But uh, thanks to second of our forums. Forai? Or forums? No, no, no forums, for, because, it's, because, it's, uh, because it's Greek. There we go. Uh, this is called Back to the Future. How many of you have seen ba- the film Back to the Future? About three people. Uh, that's fine. I'm Doc Brown, or Doc Broom, as 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 we call it. Those of you who have seen the film, it's about uh, time travel. Michael J. Fox, plutonium-powered DeLorean, going back to sort out his parents' lives, and then in number three, for it managed the last three films, zipping off uh, into the future uh, to do. Actually, it was number two. They zipped off into the future. So what we're going to be doing over the next uh, 45 minutes or 5 hours or 10 minutes, depending on uh, what the guys say, uh, is look at Scotch whisky and American whisky, uh, where it has been, where it is now, and where it is going. Uh, and for purely arbitrary reasons, uh, I've decided to set a, kind of, set a kind of 50-year limit on this. So, uh, the very first question, just as we were going to whiz off in our DeLorean back to 1970, Charlie was still writing, Charlie's probably writing about whiskey in 1970, to be honest. Uh, But if you can think in terms of where the Scotch whiskey industry was in 1970, what, what was it like in those days? Well, um, as you know, Dave, um, I started to write about whiskey in 1981, but the, um, I was very familiar with whiskey by 1970, but unaware of what was happening in the whiskey industry. The whiskey industry in 1970 was in um, a very poor state. Um, Actually, no, it was, it was in, in the later 70s that it began to become in a poor state. Post-war, Scotch, blended Scotch whiskey was the drink of the free world. And so the, a lot of distilleries were, as soon as there was grain available and um, money available, they expanded production and um, to produce for this hugely expanded demand for blended Scotch whisky. Um, new distilleries were, were established, but the, and a lot of the established distilleries were expanded. Um, 
And this, this, this went on happily until so about 1978. Um, and then through, through global economic reasons, you know, the, the, and fashion. Um, and, that, 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 that dry, and this is very seminal for when we start talking about what's going to happen in the future. Um, because the, you know, the, the global economy and the, 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 the money that people have in their pockets... Um, the whiskey industry depends upon that, people being able to afford to buy. So there's fashion, there's um, you know, global economics, money in pocket. Um, and it, everything was going fine during the 1960s. And so the, there's a huge, huge expansion in capacity, the amount of spirit that was made by the Scotch whiskey distilleries um, in order to meet the anticipated demand ongoing yeah and the um, but come the, there was a serious dip in 78 79 and then a very very serious dip in the very in the early 80s which led to the closing down of many many distilleries in 1983 and 1985 um, uh, because there was a surplus the the the, the, the demand the, the, for, for, for Scotch whisky had changed. It was no longer fashionable. Um, vodka and, and, and rum, particularly Bacardi branded ones, um, had, uh, had taken over. And the younger consumers um, had turned from what was now regarded as dad's drink or even grandpa's drink in its scotch um, in favor of white 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 spirits. Yeah. So the, the industry, the Scotch whisky industry was in, was in a terrible state. And, the, and as I say, a lot, a lot of deserts yeah. closed in the early yeah. 80s. You know, it strikes me, you know, picking up what Charlie was saying, that it was a very different place in the 1970s. You know, it was, there was no such thing as single malt. It was blend dominant. Uh, maybe even the style of whisky was different. Yeah, um, I was quite shocked to hear you in Say 1970, it makes me feel quite old. I was thinking how soon, you know, recent that was. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> and I was just thinking about what happened in that period for myself. And um, and, I, and I, my parents were very moderate drinkers, so I suppose we had drams when people come around for a wee kale or well, we definitely did. Um, and also, of course, um, for for uh, New Year and all that sort of thing. But I think. Uh, from my memory, we were maybe a wee bit spoilt because we were in a distilling area, and of course, it was a time when they stopped doing dramming at the distilleries, and they started, you know, giving people a bottle, and not always a labelled bottle. So there's a lot of whisky went about that wasn't really you wouldn't know what it was, um, but it was mostly malt. Mm. Um, and so within my part of Scotland at that stage, I think my first experience was very much around. Um, I don't know if I like that kind of malt that's a wee bit thin, you know, oh, yeah. third fill or something. Uh, but that one's a bit better, there's a bit more about it. So that was probably my first experience. But I do remember um, in that time and thinking a lot about uh, it now that uh, it was very, very, very vibrant. Mm. You know, very vibrant. Just as you described, that late 60s, early 70s period. And you would go... I, I tell a story about my aunties. And uh, they, they lived in England. They went down to England when they were very young. They were very anglified, quite to their shock and horror. Um, but they used to come up, you know, and uh, the Glen, you know, Glendronach, and they would head off there once during their summer holidays to uh, see the distiller the there. I think at the time it was a combination of Albert Chand and Tom. I'm trying to remember Tom's second name. It doesn't matter. But they always went up there for one night with my mum and my father and my uncles and aunties to Glen House. And, um, and they did drink single malt because they used to bring it back with them in the little dumpy Glendronach bottle, you know. And it was very treasured by my aunties because you couldn't get it in England. Oh, yeah. So oh. there was no single malt going to England hardly at all, no. you know, no. No. in the 70s. So that was quite obvious. The other thing they used to come back with next day, uh, much to our uh, sort of puzzlement, was they always had the flu when they came back from the Glen House next day <laughs> <laughs> for a fair part of the day. <laughs> But that's certainly true that blending whiskies, I'm sure my father would have kept the local blends in the cupboard. Um, maybe a odd bottle of uh, single malt for, uh, you know, but probably not labelled. And So no, uh, single malts weren't, weren't a big thing at all. Yeah, definitely not. That, yeah. that, that, that's Ch very important. Yeah. I mean, you were brought up in Mauritius, 
the, the whiskey country, the malt whiskey country. And so there would have been more um, malt whiskey available um, than anywhere else in the world. And the, I mean, in, by, by 19, 1970, um, the, the only one in every hundred bottles was bottled as single malt whiskey. And the, um, it was, it was the, 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 the market and indeed all the distilleries were geared to supplying the blenders. Blended scotch was where it was at. Really since, since 1900, or since, yeah, yeah since yeah, at least yeah, 1900. Yeah, and, yeah. The, um, um, and they geared their production to, well, you can talk m- more about this, Mark, the, uh, but they geared the production to the demands um, of the blenders, you know. M- so m- the, the most, we'll, we'll talk about this later, but the, the most significant development is, is the, the growth and growth of, of, of malt whiskey. Yeah. So, Mark, uh, 50 years ago, what was happening in America? You know, did, what, what, was the, what was the industry? And no, I'm not saying you were there, you know, but, but well, you know, I, 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 how was bourbon? You know? I was still a wee bairn. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean you can't drink whiskey. Does it? <laughs> <laughs> 1969 was my first. How's that? Can you hear me out there now? Uh, Let's try this one. Well, 1969 was my first recollection of whiskeys. Charlie, I do this for a living. (laughs) I I project. I project. But uh, 1969 was my first experience, or first even recollection of remembering whiskey, and it was uh, ironically reading the memoir at the time of Mario Andretti, the great race driver who wrote a memoir after he won the Indianapolis 500 that year and talked about being driven from Dayton to Indianapolis for an appearance by a guy that apparently had had so much... The reference in the book was that he had had so much Johnny Walker that they could have run the car 500 miles on the fumes (laughs) and still had plenty left over. My experience back then was... uh, a few years later, pouring seven and sevens, Seagram's Seven Crown American Whiskey mm. and Seven Up for my father's friends. Yeah. Yeah. The bourbon industry in the early had really peaked in the late 60s, early 70s, and was in decline because of the same reasons. People were drinking rum and vodka, yeah. and bourbon distilleries were going out of business right and left. We were basically down to maybe 10 in the entire country. Then... We did not have single malts, barely. I mean, I didn't know what a single malt whiskey was at that point. I knew what Chivas Regal and Johnny Walker were growing up because we had those in the house. And my dad wasn't a big whiskey drinker, but he kept those around for friends. So the idea of drinking single malts was something that was just uh, not even on the radar screen for people of my generation until really maybe 10 to 15 years ago. Yeah, Not to I, say that you guys yeah. are all old farts, but... Uh, yeah, I, I'm interested. I mean, what, what lessons do you think we've learned from that, from that period of time? You know, you, you, you imagine, imagine you're in your DeLorean and you've gone back to 1970s and you've gone, this is what I want to take into the present in terms of whiskey production, in terms of whiskey flavour. The first... Go ahead. First thing I want to do is go find the idiot that decided to close Rosebank, Port Ellen, <laughs> um, a couple of those other distilleries and smack him upside the head and say, no, you idiot, that's going to be really popular liquid in a few years. Don't close these distilleries. That's a crystal ball. That's a crystal ball. Well, we- I mean, Rosebank was closed for simple um, commercial reasons that they, they couldn't get the bloody trucks. Oh, in, yeah, I know. You know? And, the, and, and Port Ellen was closed because... The, the United Distillers, the DCL, had, had Lagavulin. And, and remember, in those days, the, the, there was no demand for smoky whiskies. Smoky whiskies for, for blends were described as being condimental. They were like pepper and salt in a blend. A very small amount, a very small amount, will, will, will and like you know, 2%, 5% in a blended scotch will, will influence so the the distillers company had um, 
had they had they had two smoky whiskey Kalila and um, Lagavulin, and they and they also had um, Port Ellen. Port Ellen needed an awful lot of work, and so when the axe fell in '83 and then '85, um, it was they were both sacrificed. Oh, I know, but you know, still we can only hope. Yeah, I know, but you see, you're looking at it from the point of view of now, you I know. know. And the, the and although you see Rosebank, well Rosebank, I mean Portland was never um, esteemed. Um, Rosebank was esteemed, um, and so it is. It is. It is a, perhaps a bit surprising that the uh, the closed Rosebank, but it was for purely pr- practical to do with delivering malt. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember hearing a, a great story about Portellan <coughs> from uh, a guy who. He used to break into the Port Ellen warehouses. Uh, People <laughs> like, like you, you, you know, like <laughs> you know, like uh, Mission Impossible. You know, a bit like that. Somehow he managed to break into the Port Ellen warehouses, and he went, "You know what? You know, I knew every single cask in that warehouse, <laughs> every single cask." And I went, "No, like you know, you think you've just broken into a warehouse? You're going to take it as much as you can, as quickly as you can." He went, "Oh no, 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 no." Imagine, imagine if you'd taken all that trouble breaking into a warehouse and you ended up with fucking Port Ellen, you know. <laughs> uh, I, and that was somebody from Isla stealing whiskey, you know. Uh, that was kind of the level <laughs> of appreciation that Port Ellen had in yeah. those days. I but if they'd kept it open, we wouldn't be paying $4,000 a <laughs> bottle for it today. Uh, what bottles would you keep from the 1970s, Mark? Uh, for myself... Um, for myself, I'd probably have kept some of those dumpy Glendronachs that I drank. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was lots of them about. And uh, my mother and father moved house from the big house in 1987, I think it was, when, about a few years after they retired. And um, they used to have the winter cupboard, you know, for, and in the winter cupboard, the top half was sort of food and candles and such things. And then down below, it was quite deep, and down below they had... My folks never drank beer, and, but they used to get given beer. So when I, I went home to help them move, and uh, we were still dragging out beer from 1968, <laughs> 1970, <laughs> cans of tenants and stuff. But behind it, uh, there was 136 bottles of unlabeled whiskey, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which delighted all my cousins. And, that, and now I wish I'd kept some of them, you know. Uh, but I think the other thing that um, you referenced to some way... Uh, sort of liberating some whiskey in Isla, um, is the amount of copper dogs that used to be around. Mm. So, you know, the other thing in the area in Strasbourg Bay was that um, every man at worth in a distillery would somehow be able to filch some whiskey at some point in time. And, you know, they had quite often absolutely no idea what they were filching. You know, they were just, uh, you know, into the back of the cask and... A, a copper dog is an illegal a, a copper made by the coppersmith to go down the front of your overalls and they could be round and quite a lot of them were flat and went across the belly and they wouldn't take a terrible lot maybe half a pint or three quarters of a pint of whiskey but if you do that five days a week it's quite a lot of whiskey <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of them are very fond of the cleric and, um, and that's the other thing that I sort of wish I mean, Gordon McPhail got a fantastic collection of cleric, you know, and it's quite interesting to go through uh, New Spirit. It's quite interesting to go through it and see the points of difference over the decades. Um, and, of course, I wish I had some of that now because there was an awful lot around as well because a lot of the boys used to like to drink the cleric. And the last time I saw a cleric uh, being drunk was very late in the piece in the 80s. And, um, and this guy had the most incredible uh, collection of whiskey. This guy called Billy Bues, and he was the postman in Huntley or one of the postmen in Huntley, and he used to collect whiskey, uh, and he collected whiskey since he was a very young man, very famous, but he never drank it. He only drank free whiskey. And, uh, and, it, and if you're at the Glen, and right up into the 80s, in the, it's hard to believe now, but right up into the 80s, in the middle of the courtyard, and you've all been there, um, they used to have a, it looked like a wishing well, and under the wishing well roof, there was a bucket, and then the bucket was full of cleric. Well, cleric, yeah. <laughs> and Billy, and a wee tin cup. And Billy Bees used to help himself to this cleric, you know. And if he was on a good mood in the cleric, your mail would not get delivered that day, you know. And if he weren't. So I wish I had some of that as well. I wish I had some of these things that were taken for granted and have all right. gone, you know. And, and of course, 
uh, like Charlie and Mark talking about Rosebank and Brewer and all the rest of it. Well, when we first opened the shop, um, a company called New Zealand Wines and Spirits uh, found that they were being amalgamated with another company, and the warehouseman rang me up. We'd only been open a little while and said, Mate, he said, I've got all these unpronounceable whiskies here uh, called Brewer and something K A O L I L A and Da Lee Owen and Da Di Da and all the rest of it. And, the, and what they'd done in 1995, they'd imported a whole heap of the rare the Christmas, it was a uh, rare malt series, uh, you know, about eight different uh, distilleries. And they hadn't ever sold them. And this was in 2004 or five. And he said, if you would take them off our hands, you're going to have them for cost price. We bought the Brora in 1972, I think it was, uh, for $86 a bottle, you know. And we put it on special on a barrel in front of the shop. <laughs> To get, because we bought a lot of it and we couldn't really afford it. So I wanted to get rid of it as soon as we could, you know. And I think it's about $2,000 a bottle or something, you know. You know and it was just, and they're flying out the door all these rare whiskies, and over the years, you know, I mean, it's for drinking, so I'm very happy people have enjoyed it. Uh, but if I had gone back 50 years and knew what was going to happen, I would have probably put a few in the warehouse. <laughs> uh, did, did, Charlie, do, do you think the flavour has changed from 50 years ago to, to now? There's no doubt at all it has. The, um, the I mean, well, I'm privileged to t- be asked to taste and evaluate um, um, whiskies made in the 60s and 70s. Um, what's interesting is that some of them have been bottled now at ancient age, but if you taste them in, during the 60s, the a, a common age, a bottling age, was eight, eight, eight years, eight, eight to ten years. I mean, as you were saying, Mark, the very few, very few malts around, um, but they tend to be bottled young if they were given an age statement at all. Um, and it's really interesting looking at these. Um, and so we, we, I have a group of friends, and we call ourselves Now and Then. And the, um, we, we put together a tasting which is of... Um, we have a theme which might be sherried whiskies or it might be blended whiskies or whatever or isla whiskies or whatever and the um, and we come up with a bottle of whatever brand um, from the 60s, 70s um, and we compare it with blind with a contemporary bottling and you know in every tasting we've done, and we haven't done that many, but let's say half a dozen, we've, we, and we have to guess which was now and which was then, and we evaluate them, we, we nose and taste, and, um, and give them a score. Uh, and in every case, um, we've never been wrong on now and then, and in every case, then scored higher, which is a very sad thing to comment on. Yeah. But the, the, um, there, was some, there was something, and it's terribly difficult, well, I mean, we could discuss this, because it's terribly difficult to, it's in, in fact, it's impossible to just put your finger on why, how whiskey, how whiskey has changed and why. There are so many factors that, um, uh, that might influence it, do you know? Well, the, 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 I mean, everyone makes a great virtue of, of wood and the understanding of wood management has been increased oh, so much in the last 20 years. You know? But, I mean, the old days, they just used to, they would disgorge, they would disgorge a, ba- a, a, a barrel or whatever, and then they would sniff it, and then they would mark it uh, either with a tick or a cross. And the, uh, so refill or get rid of it. You know? and the, uh, but now, um, now, of course, they understand the, the huge impact, particularly for malt whiskey, because for blended whiskey... As long as you had a mature spirit, they, and the blender would just put it together and make the blend that he wanted. And he didn't want too much um, wood influence. Mm. You know, so there were refill casks. And the, um, but now the, 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 the cask is king, in a way. And, the, right. um, and to some extent, this is not necessarily a good thing, because you, really you're looking for a balance between the distillery character and the mature character. As I'm sure you but, agree. But Mark, I mean, do, do, you might want to pick on... Uh, yeah. Please do pick up on that. But also, I'd quite like to, to, to ask you about 
how you, in your experience, what has the flavour shifted from the bourbons specifically made in those days, which you know, were maybe made for, for a different type of market and, and where we are now. But please pick up on, on the Let me on, do that first Scotch. and yeah. pick up on that. I'm wondering if it's not more an issue of the barley and the yeast the distillers are using because we're all now using, or I should say, they're all now using very similar strains of barley because these things have been engineered to produce a lot of alcohol but not necessarily the same flavor that the old barley's produced. They're all using prepackaged distiller's yeast, which generates the same flavors. And essentially we've, and I hate to use this pun, distilled a lot of the flavor out of those older, from those older whiskeys, out of those malts that uh, had a lot of influence years ago compared to what we have now. I'm wondering if that may be the case where the cask is playing more of an influence because the barley and the yeast aren't. Yeah. It's the same thing with bourbons. Um, the casks really haven't changed. It's still new American oak. I think what has happened, though, is it's gotten more consistent. You don't have people half-hammered from drinking Cleric working in the stills anymore. The lab equipment is much better, and they're actually able to make the cuts and do things more consistently and produce a higher quality or at least a more consistent quality of spirit than what we had back in the day. Back in the day, the blenders could uh, take those great casks with all those flavors and come up with something really unique, but if they all have the same flavors and the same flavor characteristics now, it's hard to create a special blend. It's quite interesting, that, because the, the, um, uh, to some extent, the, and, and I, I do agree with you, so the, the barley varieties, and the, but there, there were all other factors, and not least um, was the, um, the, the cleaning regime. Now, we, Dave and I were talking about this, was it yesterday or today, or, or constantly, I mean, over the years, um, there are certain flavors. I mean, the, the, the classic example is Kleinish, the, the waxy characteristic in Kleinish, which is so precious and so delicious. Where does it come from? Poor maintenance of the pipes and the, and the, and the, and the receivers, you know? And the... Um, Thank you very much. The, um, um, so, I mean, there are all the multiple influences on... on um, on flavor yeah. in the 70s, um, particularly the 70s, 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to kind of move it to today and then fairly speedily perhaps move it on to where we think things are going. Uh, Mark, I mean, looking at American whiskey in particular, I mean, comparing to what it was, say, in the 1970s, 1980s, you know, what's the health of the American whiskey? market now, not just bourbon, but the American whiskey market. Oh, boy. You've only got two minutes. That's going to be interesting. We're, we're, it's really, I hate to use the cliche, but it's only time's going to tell because we've gone from 15 years ago maybe having 100 distilleries maximum because craft distilling hadn't taken off at that point to having more than 1,800 now. Not all of them producing whiskey. Many producing just gin, vodka, and lesser spirits. And lesser, the, lesser, no. lesser spirits, yes. I use that term facetiously. Vodka makes great hand sanitizer from what I'm hearing these days. Although the folks at Tito's say don't use theirs because it's not strong enough. Yeah, yeah. Dose yourself in vodka, folks. You'll, yeah, save Best use for vodka ever. Yeah. But... I am of two minds on this. Part of me thinks that we are at almost a renaissance in American distilling because it's not just bourbons. As you well know, we were in Seattle a couple of weeks ago. There's more than 200 distilleries making American single malts now, even though we have no definition for it in U.S. law. And very few of those folks have even started exporting yet. And I'm curious to see what's going to happen if that category takes off and becomes its own special category, because that could be a game changer for the American whiskey industry. Mm. I think bourbon, we've already saturated the world with bourbon in many ways. When I, you can go out here in these rooms and see half a dozen major bourbon brands, 
I think we have gotten to the point where commodity bourbon, and I hate to use that term, but I will in this case, has really gone to the point where I don't know how much further it can go in terms of sales and market penetration because people aren't going to be willing to pay $100 a bottle in Christchurch for a six-year-old bourbon bottled at 37.5% ABV or lesser or whatever you sell it at or whatever you lower it down to to get around the tax standards. I think if you can have the creativity that a lot of these smaller distillers have, even though they don't have the economies of scale to keep their costs down, I think that has some potential if they can make some money. If they can make enough money to stay in business long enough, be able to expand. I know of probably half a dozen distilleries that have shut down already. Mm. And if the government doesn't screw it up, with uh, taxes and the uh, excise taxes in the U.S., I think that the potential could be very good. I think the potential could also be very bad because we're going to start getting a a glut of whiskey on the market in the next couple of years as some of these little guys get their whiskey out there. And I don't know if the market can take it all. Uh, That's fascinating. And and, and just kind of chiming in, uh, again, coming back to Seattle, I mean, see what the guys in High Wire are are doing with really old varieties, like like Jimmy Red, which is insane corn variety, and old dries and and everything. It seems to be an incredibly fertile uh, time for American whiskey now. You see also, yeah, it's Jeff the Creed and what they're doing with bloody butcher corn. If these guys can bring back the heirloom varieties of grain, including some of the barley stocks that we used to use years ago that uh, folks like the folks that Washington State University are working with. They're trying to bring back some of these heirloom grains that have the flavor characteristics that we'd love to have that would make great tasting whiskeys. But when you have an industry that is essentially run for the benefit of the beer industry, which uses a boatload more grain than distillers ever will, all the barley that's being produced is designed to fit the brewer's needs and not necessarily the distiller's needs. So if these smaller guys can get back to the craft barleys and small-scale malting houses and the ability to make small batches of whiskey for a local market, think of it this way. Um, those of you here from Christchurch, you can certainly go to Wendy's or Burger King or McDonald's anytime you want, but I'll bet you probably go to local restaurants because you want local food. Same thing with whiskey. I think that's where we're headed. I hope that's where we're headed. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's really important because, right, you, you pick up on that, that, that guys. You know, uh, where is Scotch at the moment? And let's begin to think about uh, how we're going to move this forward. Well, it's going, it's going in a similar parallel. Um, well, I did a sort of back-of-the-envelope calculation um, a couple of years now, so it's, it's, it's out of date. Um, my estimation, as you say, there's now about, well, about 40, 37, 40 new distilleries since 2004, um, and another 30 odd projected. Some of them won't be built. Um, the, and then there's the expansion of some of the major distilleries Glenlivet, Glenfiddich, and McCallum, etc. And but on my back of the envelope, it was I, I estimated that the capacity, the amount of spirit that can be made by the Scotch whisky industry since 2004 has increased by 60%. Now, where is, where is it going, all going to go? And as I mentioned earlier, the, um, the traditional um, customer was the blender. You know? But blending whisky is sort of... Oh, it's doing well in Africa and in South America and other places. It's still the, it's still the backbone of the Scotch whisky industry. But the, 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 but, 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 but uh, malt whiskey, single malt whiskey, is 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 growing in in pretty well every market. These new guys, um, and particularly the smaller distilleries, are going to have to rely on. They can't sell. They can't sell fillings. The 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 the. So they're going to have to rely on selling their whiskies through the likes of uh, uh, Michael um, as single malts. 
there's going to be a hell of a press in the marketplace uh, in five, or well, it's already beginning, but in five, ten years' time, when all these, these Scotch brands. And Michael would probably say, you know, well, hey, you know, I mean, you guys, I mean, you, 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 you'll try it. We're all, we're all plurists, you know. A new, a new malt comes up, and we'll try it. But this is one, one of the glorious things about the uh, Dramfest, um, an opportunity to try some uh, little-known whiskies and new ones, you know. We'll try it. We'll try it once, you know. Will we buy the second bottle? And, the, and so Michael's got to take a well-known brand off the shelf to put an unknown brand on the shelf, which all of us might try once, you know. So, and the, almost, the, almost too much choice, Michael. I mean, yeah, did, did, well, yeah. Um, you know, when we first started the business, uh, I think there were, there were 84 <coughs> single malt distilleries operating, and, and other ones were mothballed or closed, and some have come back and some haven't. But it is challenging. I mean, we do get um, an offer... <laughs> from a distiller somewhere in the world weekly, to be honest, to, because we're importers as well, and we import and distribute. Um, and I mean, as an importer, never mind a retailer, you have a portfolio of whiskies which you hope complement each other. You know, one or two from Isla, four or five from the Highlands, New York, five or six from the Speyside region, a couple of Lowlands, Daddy Darn, American, uh, a Swedish, a couple of Irish, whatever, you know, but they have to complement each other because you're going out to the liquor lands and the restaurants and what have you to try and, you know, give a balanced portfolio. And as a whiskey specialist, I mean, we don't have wines or beers or such stuff. So, therefore, you, you, you really have to be careful how balanced it is. So, if someone offers you something new, does it fit into your portfolio? Where does it fit? Is it good? Is it exciting? Have they got a, 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 something for you to work with in the marketing, marketing of, the, of the whiskey, etc.? You know, uh, so it's it's very interesting. At the same time, the interest is there, you know, uh, from all of you. So, therefore, wherever possible, we will bring in new whiskies, and we've had the, the first English whiskey in our portfolio, the Cotswolds, you know, which has uh, been a tremendous hit. You know, uh, I never thought I'd say, <laughs> say that about an English whiskey. You know, yeah, Cos- so, Coswell's very good. Yeah, dude. but yeah. Uh, but it's very good, and people are enjoying it. So when it works, it works. Right. You know, uh, but it is quite. Uh, you do think to yourself, you know, forty new whiskies. Oh, you know, um, it's it's going to be quite quite challenging. And of course, your consumption is going to go up quite a bit. You know, to <laughs> to <laughs> to bring it all in together in a responsible fashion. But yeah. at the same time, when we and these guys are doing it more than I am, but I, I'm very fortunate to get back to Scotland and Ireland and different places uh, once or twice a year. You know, but it, it is interesting. And, and when the folk are here from the Kilhomans and the Ardnamurchans and various distilleries, you know, they are thinking about yeast variety, grain variety. Yeah, um, that's the key ca- thing. Cask innovation. You know, they really are thinking to the future and have been for. I mean, the Kilhoman came out with the. I can never remember the, the, the recharge, re what's it, and, right. you know, all SDR, that sort of stuff. Yeah. SDR, SDR, that sort of stuff. You know, I mean, I was a skeptic. Uh, I'm always a skeptic when people start messing with my whiskey, but um, I have to say, in that particular case, it worked rather well. The Pinot Noir casks from New Zealand going over to Scotland for a finish, again, skeptic proven wrong, uh, came back. It's fantastic whiskey, you know, and, and I haven't tried the new one from our bag yet, but certainly they, it's been tried now. You know, um, the Springbank have done but it twice. You, you see, know. that's very interesting, Michael, because the, 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 these new guys, they have to find other... Since they can't sell their spirit for blending purposes, or indeed the, the mature whiskey for blending purposes, they have to differentiate. And so they're exploring yeasts, they're exploring barley varieties, they're exploring woods... They're exploring long, long, long fermentations, you know, and developing flavors which will ultimately compete on flavor. Mm. And, the, and that's the key thing. Yeah, yeah no, I find it fascinating because like, there's five, maybe six distilleries in Scotland now making rye whiskey. Yeah. You know, yeah there's one distillery making oat whiskey. Uh, you know, perhaps as a one-off. It seems to be there's every, and, and looking at whiskies around the world, everybody's kind of just pushing, I mean, not necessarily they're trying to find a, a point of difference, but at the same time they seem to be looking for flavour and quality and it makes me feel really hopeful for the future yeah. uh, to, to, to be perfectly yeah. honest. The only problem is that so many of them are, 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 are such small production that the price, the, you know, there's no economies of scale and so the price is very high. 
I think, I think ultimately, though, it's, it's in the audience's hands. You know, so it's always the same story. You know, if you like it and you buy it, then they'll continue on with it and improve on it and try and get you more intrigued as time goes on and, and capture attention. As Charlie just said, it's very easy for any whiskey to come into New Zealand and put it on the shelf. The first bottle will always sell because people are interested. Today proves that. The second bottle is the one that's important, and the third one even more important, and that does not always happen. So, I mean, it's the taste. I often say when I'm doing a tasting, you know, that when I first came to New Zealand, if you're having a cup of coffee in the morning, it was Nescafe out of a you know, yeah, yeah. granula. <laughs> I can guarantee there's not many folk here in the audience today who don't have their uh, flat white or their fancy coffee in the morning down at the wee specialist barista, yeah, yeah. you know, Daria. Same with bread, you know, you're going down and getting good, uh, well made bread, you know, you've got all the options. Uh, even the fast food has become fancy, you know. So um, I think it's, it's, you know, that, that's the progression. It's not for not everybody's cup of tea and not well, I, can I, do see, it. I, I would apply the gin test. You know, you can buy, well, in Scotland, you can buy a bottle of gin, Gordon's gin, 14 quid. The, 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 the vast raft of new gins begin at about 30, 35, 40, 40 quid, you know? Now, am I going to pay, for, if I'm having a gin and tonic, am I going to pay the difference? No. The, uh... the other thing we have to think about here is that it's quite possible that not all of these distilleries will actually ever get to bottle hmm. their own stuff because of politics. If you look at what, um, oh, shall we say, a certain uh, world leader of, uh, I'm not going to go there, but um, <laughs> if you look at the impact that just tariffs on single malts from Scotland and Northern Ireland, read Bushmills, have had in the fourth quarter of this past year, when they went into effect, just in the middle of October and then November and December, that cut 25% off of Scotch whiskey exports to the United States for the quarter. Yeah. And the Scotch Whiskey Association has estimated that could, over the course of 2020, be 100 million pounds in lost sales. A lot of those... Drink more, guys. Yeah. Okay. yeah. A lot of the small distilleries are counting on those export sales to make, to make their bank, Absolutely. to make their profit. Yeah. Same thing with a lot of the small craft distillers in the U.S. that saw their export sales tank completely because of the European Union tariffs on American whiskey at 25%. They just couldn't compete on price, and the importers said, no, we're not going to... We can't sell it at an additional 25% premium. Yeah. Politics may drive a bunch of these small guys out of business if we're not careful. And we may have a glut of extra whiskey on our hands that nobody can bottle and nobody can sell. Yeah. Yeah. How did that, you, you, sorry, Michael. I was just going to say that's an interesting point because in 17 years of the store, uh, we... Well, we have refused whiskies for various reasons, but not financial, not because of the price. And last week was the first time ever that we turned down four whiskies because we, we actually thought it was a complete rip-off. You know, um, we just would have been embarrassed to have them on the shelf and offer them to, the, to a customer. That's never happened in 17 years. Wait, so. Scotch or American? No, Japanese, actually. But, Japanese. Uh, oh, but okay. nevertheless, you know. So. Yeah. Let's talk but, about but, Japanese wait, whiskey. Wait. We've but, got the, the Japanese expert. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah, they probably weren't even Japanese, but anyway. Did you hear that the, the Japanese are actually coming up with a standard? Yeah. I have for, yeah. for what actually would define Japanese whiskey for the first yeah. time? Yes, yeah. So we might not have those tankers going over from Scotland yeah. anymore. Well, I mean, the tankers have always gone on, gone over. I, I have no problem with the tankers going over from Scotland, as long as Japanese whiskey is defined as being a spirit which is entirely produced in Japan. Yeah, you know, Let's, yeah. as long as they're that, transparent yeah. about it. Because I, as I'm sure most of the audience will be aware, the, uh, uh, at present the Japanese regulations are such that the, the vast quantities of bourbon and scotch and indeed Canadian whiskey um, comes in to Japan. And if it's bottled in Japan, it can be labeled as Japanese whiskey. 
So they give it a dressing up, and, the, and it's, it's not Japanese, it's not made in Japan at all. And this is scandalous. I mean, the... the well, but, it's, it, 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 but they are working towards... Oh, yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah it's, it's imminent. Uh, right, we don't have a huge amount of time left, so we're going to jump forward into the future. Uh, and if you remember the films, which clearly you don't, uh, the, fir- the, the, the first film predicted, <laughs> predicted Back to the Future predicted flat screen TVs, it predicted drones, it predicted hoverboards, and self tying shoes. What? Yeah. What's that? Loafers. Yeah, loafers. Yeah, there we are. Not, not just loafers. Yeah. Uh, so, we're, we went 50 years into the past, we're in the present, now 50 years going forward, when you're still a young man, Charlie. Uh, what do, you think the, what do you think the whisky industry is going to look like? Who survived? How are people making whisky? Well, as you know, both of us are historians of whisky. Um, so all you can learn you, oh, in projecting to the future, you have to look at the past. Um, the history of Scotch has been up and down. Um, at the moment, we're on uh, the, uh, probably the most extreme curve up um, than ever in history. Um, uh, in terms of consumption, in terms of auction prices, in terms of the interest in, 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 in old whiskey, um, the industry has to and, and uh, 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 always has to anticipate, well, certainly since the war, um, the Second World War, the um, anticipate demand. So the production regimes are geared to anticipated demand in you know, 5, 10, 20 years' time, um, which, were, which were, as we were talking about, um, usually... Demand for blended Scotch whisky. The demand for blended Scotch is, yeah, kind of steady, but nothing. It's not making so much money as as, as malt whisky. This all has to be put into the into the the computer or the the um, the guys who hmm. guess these things. So, where is it going to go? I think that the um, the first prerequisite is that people have to have money in their pocket. And so the first prerequisite is global e- the global economics. And, the, and depending upon... There are certain African countries, there are certain um, South American countries. China is looking very good. Uh, Taiwan was, of course, a major market. But the Taiwanese economy is not doing so well. And so the, but the, so the, the first thing is that the, the global market... It depends upon people having money in their pocket. Second thing is availability. The whiskey has to be available. Michael has done an astounding job in uh, uh, in, in New Zealand and indeed supplying some southern Australia or whatever. Um, but the you, the whiskey has to be available. Uh, the third thing is, um, if you like, um, promotion through social media in China particularly, um, and India, um, but social media or, or, or av- advertising. Advertising um, works, well, you're the expert on this, Mark, but the uh, works very well um, for ble- so, uh, lifestyle advertising. By and large, um, malt whiskey drinkers don't like to be advertised to. So there are all kinds of factors. Um, so projecting all this, but the, no, but the, so my, finally, the the one thing that one does learn from the, the the history and the ups and downs is that whiskey, Scotch whiskey, will prevail. Do you know? I mean, it's a it's a difficult flavour. It's not a drink that's immediately appealing to young people. You know, I must say, young teenagers. You know, um, the. Um, but once the taste, it's the comple- it's, it is the most complex spirit in the world and acknowledged to be such. You know, better than brandy, rum, well, you're the expert on rum, but the, I mean, the flavor profiles of rum or indeed uh, brandy, brandy, cognac, mm-hmm. um, 
Armagnac, Spanish brandy. I'm a great admirer of Spanish brandy. But the, the flavor profile is relatively simple compared to the complexity available, particularly with Scotch malt whiskey. Um, so the, but once the flavor has been... Um, when you, when, once you're turned on to the, to the, to the, to, to the flavor of whiskey, mm. um, you know, it's, it's a hugely rewarding um, uh, and enjoyable... It, it's the go-to spirit. Well, so, so I think that it will prevail... Mark, I, I was going to pick up something that, that we chatted about in Seattle a couple of weeks back, which was sustainability yeah. uh, and, you know, and, and the fact that the world will have changed because of climate change. And, and you've got issues such as glass, yeah. for example. Uh, you, the, the bottles may look gonna, different. In yeah, we're going to have to have that discussion about the carbon impact of shipping pallets full of heavy glass bottles full of liquid around the world for recreational use. Or medicinal use. <laughs> and we're going to have to have that discussion, along with wider discussions about sustainable forestry for the casks that we're using and sustainable farming for the barley. It's going to be a bigger conversation also because we're going to have to look at uh, what certain uh, critics of whiskey in the health professions would like to do. They would like to treat alcohol the way they have, and with the same fervor that they have done tobacco in the last 20 years. So who knows what we're, yeah, so who knows, yeah, I'm not saying it's a great thing. I'm just, let's acknowledge the reality. They're talking about, in many countries, the World Health Organization would like to have marketing bans and advertising bans on alcohol. WHO is completely discredited. I mean, yeah, yeah, let them, let's yeah, let them worry yeah. about coronavirus. Let's yeah. let us, leave yeah. us alone. I mean, d- d- given that whiskey is a long-term business, and we all agree yeah. whiskey is a long-term business, is enough being done now to anticipate the major changes which are going to be happening? I think so. Last week I was in Kentucky at the uh, University of Kentucky's Beam Institute for Distilled Spirits, their brand new institute that they founded with a $5 million donation from Beam Suntory to create, no, to actually to start distilling programs and to do the research that distillers need to plan for the future. One of the things that they're funding is sequencing the genome of American white oak trees, which has never been done, and it's going to be a multi-year project. But the idea is that if you can sequence that genome, then you can recreate it if we have a major global climate catastrophe or even a regional one that does significant damage to the trees that we all depend on in this industry. So that's one of the projects they're working on is sequencing the DNA so that they can actually recreate it down the road. It's one of the things that uh, they're working with farmers on sustainable barley Mm -hmm. growth, on how do we solve the problems with climate, with flooding in the Midwest, in the uh, yeah. Ohio River, Mississippi River valleys, where a lot of the corn that's used for bourbon is grown. So the research is being done. Scotch Whiskey Research Institute is doing some great work. There, Harriet Watt, yeah. all these folks. I don't know that we've done the discussion that the industry needs to have within itself about, okay, at what point can we get the consumers to start maybe accepting screw caps? Mm-hmm because they're more sustainable than cork. At what point can we get them to accept PET bottles? Because one of the things I found out... (laughs) Yeah, but you're going to scream when you hear this. I I found this out talking with Kevin Smith from Beam Centauri. used to be master distiller at Maker's Mark, and he does a lot of stuff now supervising Kentucky production. They've got a thing for their lower-end bourbons now in their Frankfurt bottling plant where they actually mold the bottles from PET on site. They get these blanks, little small blanks about the size of a test tube, thousand of them in a box. They put it in the mold, heat it up, it forms the bottle on the site. They're not shipping a thousand pallets of glass. They're taking that thousand bottles, they can put it into a box, ship it FedEx to the bottling plant. They're not shipping it across the country or importing it from China or wherever to make those bottles, but they're actually making the bottles on site now from these blanks that are completely recyclable. Uh, uh, That's the important point. And that's the important point, because we still can't get glass recycled easily 
but we can get plastic recycled. Are we willing, are you guys willing at some point to accept a high quality single malt whiskey that's bottled in a plastic bottle? Certainly not. If you can, if, <laughs> but if you can make, if they can make the argument that by doing so, we're able to save this much carbon, we're able to make this much of an impact on the environment by doing it this way, and we're able to actually say, yeah, we can still have whiskey for you in 20 years because we're actually trying to take the steps now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, as a purist, I want glass. Yeah. I've got to be honest, I'm getting tired of breaking corks off in my bottles, but uh, we have, re- to, talk, have yeah. to have the discussion. Yeah, uh, as a realist, you're thinking uh, yeah. future. Michael, uh, finally, because uh, that, that little dingy ding thing yeah. meant we were, we were okay. over time. Uh, looking at, you know, when you're there on your Zimmer frame going around... Uh, <laughs> Going around whiskey galore, and in, in, in 50 years' time, the shelves will be lighter. Uh, but what do you think the shop is going to look like in terms of range in 50 years' time? Uh, well, obviously, more world whiskies, uh, certainly more. Um, I mean, as an optimist, um, more New Zealand whiskey, obviously. Um, and I think, I think also, it's a pretty exciting time to be in whiskey, to be honest, right now for me, anyway. Uh, but I think it's even more exciting in the future, just because of the amount of thought that's got. I think in the 90s, early 2000s, all the exciting whiskey we were getting was by happen chance. I mean, uh, in the, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, they weren't planning, you know. But I think since that period, they've been planning. I mean, I know all these distillers here for a long time have been putting that whiskey away and this whiskey away. And I just held, heard Alan Winchester talking about. You know, you don't want too rich a cask if you're going to have a 40-year-old whiskey and all that sort of stuff. So the planning, forward planning, is, is, is very good. And um, the expertise is much better than it's ever been. The enthusiasm is much better. Um, so I think it's really exciting, actually. And I think the fact that, for Scotch anyway, it's the most complex of all, all the whiskies you can possibly get, um, or drinks, actually. I, I just think that that stands us in very good stead. Having taken on Mark's point, though, I think with the um, as a business, uh, the green aspect of our business uh, has become very important to us. So to reassure uh, Mark on that, too, two years ago we signed up with a company to try and become uh, carbon neutral by 2022. Um, and I th- they do it for us, basically. We provide the information, they tell us how we do it. And although I don't think it's easy, it's highly achievable. Mm-hmm. So you know all these things that people are projecting forward, None of it's impossible. It's, it's all achievable, but you have to have the uh, wherewithal, the expertise, and, of course, the desire. So um, I'm a very much the eternal Scottish optimist. Very unusual. <laughs> so, <laughs> <such a> thing. <laughs> so I always uh, look at, look at the, the, the glasses, uh, always half full and, and increasingly getting fuller. So I, uh, <laughs> uh, that's the way I live my life. And uh, with, with the obvious concerns that everybody has for different things. But, um, no, I'm feeling good about the whole thing. I'm very excited. Uh, going back to the New World whiskies and, and the American single malts and such, have you, uh, we were always trying some, you know, and, and, and trying them five years ago could be quite a painful exercise. Uh, yeah, but now, you know, you can see that, you can see the flip side of that, you know, and, and they've, they've made all the mistakes and they're learning from their mistakes and what have you. So it's, it's becoming a much more exciting field as well. Uh, of course, never be as good as Scotch, but you know, it's, it's, it's coming along fine. You know? And also, I, I, actually, the whiskey that you had here was Glenallachie, which had been finished in a Caval yeah. rye cask. So here's a, a phenomenal, you know, an amazing, Caval are an incredible distiller. Uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful whiskey. You know, so there we go. Uh, guys, thank you so much. Uh, lots you. of stuff. You know, this is, you know, the future of whiskey is such a massive, massive topic. Uh, we've only barely scratched the surface of it. Thank you so much for your time. Amazing comments. Uh, thanks for coming along, guys. Please, the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's our Dramfest 2020 discussion on whiskey's past and its future. With Dave Broom moderating, Michael Fraser Milne and Charlie McLean sharing their knowledge and insight, and me trying to keep up. 
Thanks to Dave, Michael, and Charlie, along with our live audience and the sound crew at Christchurch Town Hall, and of course the staff of Whiskey Galore in Christchurch, New Zealand, for all of their hard work during the entire Dramfest weekend. We're able to bring you this special episode thanks to our sponsors at Redbreast and Johnny Walker, along with Heaven Hill Distillery, Lot 40, Mortlock, Writer's Tears, Sagamore Spirit, and Catoctin Creek. If you have feedback or suggestions for other things you'd like to see us do to help you pass the time during this unique period in our world's history, we'd love to hear from you. You can always use the contact form at whiskeycast.com. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. And our email address is comments at whiskeycast.com. WhiskeyCast is a production of Cask Strength Media, copyright 2020, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink... Please drink responsibly, stay safe and healthy, and thanks for listening.